All right, let's talk some cricket now on the Sportsman Zone. Day one of the second test between the West Indies and South Africa. The match being played in Guyana, the first time in 13 years that a test match has been played in Guyana. And the homeboy, Shamar Joseph, yeah, he got his first home test, not just in Guyana, but in the Caribbean as well. And he was spectacular for the Caribbean side, taking his third five-wicket haul in test cricket. Yeah, let's have a look at how things unfolded as 17 wickets fell on the opening day. The South Africans electing to bat, bowled out for 160. Joseph, the pick of the West Indies bowlers with five for 33 from his 14 overs. He was brilliant, absolutely brilliant with Jaden Seals taking three for 45. A wicket each for Jason Holder, Jamel Warrican, and make that Jason Holder, Gurakesh Moti uh, getting a wicket as well. In reply, though, the Caribbean side struggling to struggling at 97 for seven at the close. Jason Holder unbeaten on 33. The top score so far. Casey Carty got 26 and Gurakesh Moti 11. Those are the only three West Indian batsmen to get into double figures so far. Wayne Mulder with four for 18. The pick of the South African bowlers. Nandre Berger with a two for 32. Keshav Maharaj getting 1 for 6. The South Africans, by the way, were 97 for 9 at one stage before a 6 to 3 run. 10th wicket partnership brought them to that 160, and that was led by Dane Pete, who top scored with an unbeaten 38. And Berger, he made 23. He was last man dismissed. So, yeah, eventful opening day of the second test between the West Indies and South Africa in Guyana. Um, let's get the thoughts of Fazir Mohammed. Fazir, how are you doing today? Well, very much surprised. I'm doing well, but I'm very surprised to see how that pitch uh, played uh, and indeed the conditions generally because as you said correctly the first time we've had test cricket at Providence since 2011 when Darren Sammy was the captain and took five wickets on the last day as the West Indies defeated Pakistan and, and certainly just just the, listening to everyone talking about the surface they, they felt it would have been not too dissimilar from what we saw at the Queen's Park Oval which was slow and low but this was very different and indeed the energy of Shamar Joseph clearly made a difference but at the end of it all it really leaves things poised in a way where we may have a, a three-day test who knows maybe a two-day test match with 17 wickets already going down yeah let's talk about the position of the game with the West Indies at 97 for 7 of course I think everyone can admit that they're has been a lot in it for the bowlers, especially the fast bowlers. Um, given that, I mean, from your standpoint, do you feel that this has been a 160, 97 for 7 surface? No. I, I think what it has also shown up is the deficiencies in batting on yeah. both sides. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's challenging, but, but I, I see R Ricardo and Lance, this is where we find ourselves in this conundrum because when it's slow and low and, quite frankly, boring, it, it's not what you want to see. But then when there's a bit of juice, a bit of life, a bit of encouragement, because so many of, of not just our players from, from the West Indies I'm, I'm talking about, or indeed some of the emerging players in the South African setup who play a lot of T20 cricket as well, the, the technical deficiencies are exposed. So automatically you'd say, well, this was a minefield. But uh, I, I stand to be corrected by those who know a lot more the, about the game than I do. But I didn't get the sense that it was that unplayable. Credit to Shamar Joseph for bowling a full length early on, scattering the stumps of Desozzi, getting Markram to offer no shot to one angled into him, and therefore bowling at pace and a consistent full length, which is what we saw in Australia at the start of the year. And as Rian Mulder admitted, just speaking to the media a few minutes ago, he learned a lot from Shamar Joseph's bowling because he also bowled a full length. He doesn't have the pace of Joseph, but again, the fact that he got some movement through the air and off the scene exposed those technical weaknesses. So to answer your, your, your question directly, I don't think it was a 17-wicket pitch for day one. Yeah, I have to follow up um, on that one, Faz, because, you know, 
for me personally, I prefer the type of surface that I saw today. I completely agree with you that it showed up some deficiencies um, on the part of the batsmen on both sides, both the West Indies and South Africa. And I'm pretty sure we're going to hear pretty soon about um, where the surface was lacking. But I do believe, though, that especially in the Caribbean, if we continue to prepare more surfaces like this, then it will only force our batsmen, um, I guess, on one end to apply themselves better, but on the other end to understand more what they require from a technical standpoint to handle surfaces like this. I, I just want to get from you, though, what sort of surface you prefer, um, the flat track, where you are guaranteed to have five days of cricket or a surface like this where the match might end in three days but from an entertainment standpoint it is a lot better well you've answered the question already you 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 you, you you've, you've set up basically that i can only give you one answer but but i actually i, I concur with that view, that you need to have services that provide more interesting cricket. I think that was part of your comment yesterday, talking about the Australian services that force you to play good cricket. It's either you bowl well or you're carted all over the park. It's either you bat properly and consistently and aggressively, if necessary, or there's a ball with your, your, your name on it. And it's not as if the West Indies haven't succeeded in these conditions at home before in 2018 on a, on spicy surfaces in Sri Lanka uh, the the in, again Sri Lanka in the Caribbean the series finished one all it was good cricket 2019 against England the West Indies won by 10 wickets in Antigua again it was very difficult uh, for a lot of the batters to, to get going but it seems that there is that that yearning to revert to these dead flat surfaces that really test nobody that, that provide no real excitement in the game because of the fear of what could happen, like, like what is, may happen in this match, that it could be over in two and a half days, it could be over in three days. But it's only, Ricardo, and, I, and it's obvious that you concur on this point, that you get surfaces that have something for the bowlers, that encourage the batters to play attacking shots. It's only when this happens consistently at all levels of our cricket, and certainly in the regional first-class game, that we're going to see the sort of cricket that we, have, we grew accustomed to seeing on these sorts of surfaces and not worrying if a match is going to be over in two days or three days. Yeah, Faz, um, I know that you aren't as big a Liverpool fan as you were before, but I'm hoping that the shirt you're wearing isn't suggesting that you're now backing Chelsea, who spent most of the uh, season, past season, outside of the top ten and scrambled into a sixth place uh, toward the back end of the season. But let me ask you this. When the record 10th wicket partnership was going on in the South African innings, was there a change in the pitch conditions? Because the batting looked a little bit easier for that period than we had seen earlier. I don't think it was. and You could almost say the same lines for what happened in that partnership uh, between Jason Holder and Godekesh Moti until Moti got out playing a poor shot, which turned out to be the last ball of the day. It, it, it's sometimes a situation where the, the bowlers might be thinking, well, they, they, they've done the bulk of the work, they don't need to work as hard, or it's a change in bowlers. and, and the, It makes a big difference, as I'm sure you all will, will recognize, that sometimes certain bowlers excel in particular conditions while others don't because think about it we were talking about Cariso Rabada getting five more weeks to get to 300. Seven, South, seven West Indies wickets have gone down on what you could describe as a seamless track and Rabada hasn't gotten a single one. Uh, again it's probably because his style of bowling uh, uh, very very fast of course but very direct maybe doesn't suit this type of service. And therefore, uh, as far as that partnership between Piet and Berger, credit to them uh, for their determination. Remember, they only came into the team for this match. They, didn't, they weren't selected for the test match in, at Queen's Park Oval. So credit to them for their work with the bat when they've been selected primarily for, with, the, with the ball. But I would say it isn't so much about the conditions changing, but either a relaxation from the bowlers and indeed a change of bowlers that offered the batters an opportunity to really capitalize. Yeah, and for, as, as a purist and a lover of test cricket, how, how, how bothersome was it for you to see those empty stands today at the Providence? Well, Lance, 
you know, I, I told myself, well, empty stands at Queen's Park Oval are the norm. It's been like that for 15, 20 years. And we've used all sorts of excuses. Well, you know, there's World Cup football going on. There's Olympics going on. There, there's a famous occasion where one of my media colleagues arranged a boycott of, of a test match, knowing full well that nobody would turn up anyway. But at least I hoped that in Guyana, especially with Shamar Joseph, the homeboy, the, the star in Australia, and obviously was going to play, that there would be a few more. But to see a, a nearly empty stadium at Providence really brings home that message that the Caribbean cricketing audience from Jamaica to Guyana, with one or two exceptions along the way, because they haven't seen as much test cricket as some of the established venues, that they have been thoroughly disillusioned by all that has gone on. For, for the better part of a generation. And it's going to take a lot more than one outstanding cricketer or one or two decent performances to get them to come back consistently. Yeah, and I, I asked you that, Faz, because when we look at CPL in Guyana and the kind of euphoric um, embrace that we see of, of CPL cricket in Guyana, it was stark for me today to see the stands as they were. Indeed. And, and you know, the, the thing is, it's about marketing as well. I mean, you just had that interview with, with outgoing CEO Johnny Grave, but it, it's, it's almost as if you, you're not even supposed to know that a test match is being played. Certainly in Trinidad, you couldn't tell that a test match was being played. You, there, there, was, there was nothing to, let, nothing to energize you, nothing to, to really you know, fuel some sort of anticipation, no, no sorts of incentives. It, it's school holidays where kids are allowed in free, families are allowed in. Do something. As I've seen the 100 being played in England, which is, of course, limited over cricket, but they do everything possible to create that family atmosphere where kids come in, there's bouncy castles, there's balloons, there's so many different things. And it's almost as if the authorities have determined that, look, you know what? TV revenue is enough. We don't really need to do anything to bring people back to test cricket because it's too much of an effort anyway. Yeah, you know, Faz, it's interesting, and Lance as well, and I can just imagine how difficult it is um, for you two because you've been around for a lot longer than I have been. Um, but today, when I saw the empty seats, it brought me back, not even to test cricket. I could talk about 1999, a test match I'll never forget at Kensington Oval, Brian Lara's 153 and what the crowd was like uh, for that game. But I remember a Buster Cup final at Sabina Park. I think I was probably like 10 or 11 years old when the season Carl Hooper came back into regional cricket and Gareth Breeze, the off-spinner, the Jamaican off-spinner, had dominated the season and Jamaica and Guyana met in the final. And I just remember how packed Sabina Park was on that Saturday morning with Carl Hooper taking on Gareth Breeze and knocking him out of Sabina Park a, a, a few times. And, and fans were at the gate, those who didn't have tickets, begging to get in. And when I saw today, because I genuinely felt that with Shamar Joseph expected to play, that I would see some sort of a crowd at Providence Stadium. But I think it just made me realize that those days are long gone and there's no guarantee that we're, we're ever going to get them back. And it's, I think, a really tough pill to swallow, especially when you have come up at a time when the support for West Indies cricket, red ball cricket at every level was so much better than what we see today. You know, Ricardo, we don't have time to go into it in greater detail, but I took my grandsons mm -hmm. to test match cricket last year, Queen's Park Oval, Sunday morning, uh, West Indies versus India, in a place like Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. And the elder of the two grandsons, who was just six years old, when he went in, he said, Papa, where everybody? Because there was <laughs> nobody there. And, and, it, 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 I mean, and, and because I remember going to the Oval in 1976, the same experience where you had to fight to get in. I know times have changed. I know things have changed. But what is distressing is there seems to be no desire whatsoever to either educate our audiences or Caribbean people on our history in Test Match Cricket or certainly to try to market, to encourage people in a different way, in different, different strategies to come and watch Test Cricket and appreciate it for what it is. So I, I am left with the, the very sad memory 
of, my, of trying to follow in my father's footsteps who took me to the Oval, having taken my grandkids and have them say, well, look, you know, I'd rather go fishing with my father. Mm. Yeah, my, my suggestion, you know, would be, guys, that wherever Test Cricket is being held, um, that the, the, whether it be Cricket West Indies or the local boards, um, bus, teenagers, um, school cricketers, male and female, into these matches and if that's the only crowd we're going to have at least we'll have something but to watch Shamar Joseph and Jaden Seals bowl the way they did today before and after lunch and pretty much no one there to watch it was quite disheartening. Faz, thanks very much as usual. We'll be chatting again, I'm sure, yeah. throughout the course of this test match. We're not sure how long it will last, yeah. but as long as it lasts, we'll be chatting about it. Take and, and care. For, and for the record, Faz, you're not a Chelsea fan now, are you? This is not Chelsea blue. This is actually some sort of thing between grey and blue. It is not Chelsea blue. Trust me on that. All right, Faz, we'll talk again soon. Back after the break. <laughs>